Hi, I'm Vanessa Tyler. Welcome to Sartor TV. Your business will be hacked, not if, but when. How to make sure the damage isn't serious or even fatal. Ray Rothrock is a cybersecurity expert helping businesses bounce back with digital resilience. Ray, thank you so much for joining us and being here at Sartor TV. Briefly talk about your success journey. After Harvard and MIT degrees, you were off to Silicon Valley where you were very much involved as a venture capitalist. Um, what were those days like? Silicon Valley wasn't even known as the Silicon Valley when I moved there. Um, it's a little known fact, but uh, National Geographic gave it that name. They did a story on Steve Jobs and the semiconductor and Apple back in the day, and I moved there about the time this came out. In fact, I was inspired by the cover story because I used to read Nat Geo. But when I moved there, it was very, it was very small. It's mostly semiconductors. But there was this thing called venture capital, and I did three startups. Uh, I wasn't the founder. The first two failed terribly, and there's some good stories amongst that. But the third one was Sun Microsystems, a very successful computer company. Uh, and I was there when it went public. And my role at Sun at the time allowed me to meet and work with some of the bankers and the people that were writing the S-1, the document that the SEC requires. So uh, I was introduced to this, these things called venture capitalists. And I met John Doerr, the very famous uh, John Doerr that we all have read about in the New York Times and stuff. And I was living with a guy who graduated from Stanford and went into venture capital. So I was getting it from all sides. And one day, my boss, Carol Bartz, came down and said, you know, Ray, we really think you're, you know, you're grooming nicely. You've got a future here, but you probably should go to business school. So um, I went to business school and uh, decided I wanted to be a VC. So um, from there, I, uh, it was 1988. There had been a crash in 87. Uh, there weren't many slots available, but I was a little older, a little older student, a little more mature student, and I had a few connections. So I managed to land this job with the Rockefeller family, Venrock, in New York City. I remember I was, a, I was a newly wedded man. My wife, Meredith, and I had met at Sun, which was very typical uh, for a successful company. You work such long hours, your whole life is wrapped up in the company. Anyway, so uh, I promised her when we graduated from Harvard that we'd be south or west of, from like Dallas, Denver, Seattle, and we wound up in New York City. So she, she forgave me ultimately. But anyway, so I came to New York. And uh, 10 years later, I wound up in Silicon Valley uh, running Finrock's office there and eventually, you know, became the managing partner and retired in, well, would that be 2013 or something? So that, it was a, uh, I started in the Valley, went and got some education, went and worked with one of the best firms in the nation in New York City, where I learned enormous, I, you know, look, I'm from Texas. New York is a foreign country. And uh, then I migrated back to the Valley right when the internet was happening, which, you know, timing is everything, they say. You gave the green light to many cybersecurity companies. Was cybersecurity always a problem underestimated by businesses? Absolutely underestimated by businesses. You know, when the internet came along, actually when computers came along, uh, the first uh, uh, threats were basically virus. And we, we passed around floppy disks. You may remember those things. These fly, and, and the virus could get on them, and that's the way it was passed. And then when we hook computers together with a network, then they would share on the local network. And then when the internet happened, when Tim Berners-Lee came up with the World Wide Web, suddenly we were connecting computers across the globe. And there was no protection. If, if, a, if a computer was sick in London, it could infect a computer in New York. Pause that. When I was at Sun, we were on the ARPANET, which was the early vestiges of the internet in those days. So the concept of networking and all the issues involved there I had lived with at Sun. And being an engineer by training, I was always technical, always mucking around. So I would, had done a deal called Spyglass at, at Venrock. It was one of the first browser companies. Uh, so a Mosaic Browser was the one that we did from uh, NCSA. Uh, but from there, it became obviously, one of the good things about getting a, a winning deal is you get to sit in the perch and look out and say, what else, what, what comes next? What's the wave? And the wave was a firewall. We needed to put a door on that portal to the internet in order to let people in that we wanted to let in and keep people out. We wanted to keep out. So that was a very, it was a very simple rudimentary, rudimentary thing, very simple. But then it got very complicated. And then subsequent to that, then if the stuff got in, you wanted to be able to detect it. So we did intrusion detection. 
Then if it was in and trying to get out, we wanted to do leak detection, so data leak protection. And along the way, I got very, I was in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people to back leaders in the firewall space, the intrusion space, the leak space, the encryption space with PGP, and ultimately the database protection space with Imperva. So there were like five IPOs, boom, 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 during a core time of the building of the internet. So yeah, I green-lighted some good folks that happened to be seminal companies that defined how that piece of it all was going to work. So you saw early on that this could be a problem with security. Oh, absolutely, because, well, it is. <laughs> it surely is. Uh, I, just a, a small personal story. I used to, people used to kid me and say, all right, how do you know so much about it? I said, like, do you have a router in this house? Do you have it at your home or whatever? I go, I bet you I can break into it in two minutes. They wouldn't believe me, and I did. And of course, they go, how do you do that? And I go, it's really simple. It's not that hard. See, it's not that hard. That was why it appeared to me to be a problem. Digital Resilience, that's your book. You mentioned major breaches recently. How vulnerable are companies today? Well, companies are very vulnerable. Uh, they're vulnerable because the bad stuff's already inside their networks. Um, good companies with good engineers and, and sufficient budgets and capabilities, and they've probably bought all the products that, that I helped finance along the way. Um, that's all fine and good, and you need that. It's, as I said, that's necessary but not sufficient. The problem is you have human beings in your companies, and we make mistakes. Not only do we make mistakes on how we build these networks and operate these networks, but we accidentally click on a piece of phishing email or a, uh, some sort of connection that, that allows the malware to be dispersed. 95% of all the breaches that are successful, bre well, a breach is successful, of all the attacks that result in a breach, an exfiltration, if you will, start with phishing. Very simple attack. Phishing is an old thing, by the way. Benjamin Franklin used phishing in the Revolutionary War. He used to write letters impersonating other people to get them to do things. And phishing even goes all the way back to the Middle Ages when, uh, in fact, the name of the company I operate now, Red Seal, that's the wax seal that a king used to put on his documents to make sure that the recipient knew it was his. He was the authority because it was so easy to, anybody could write a document. And Ben Franklin used and to And if the seal was broken, then you knew, you knew that, that somebody was a problem. Was there may have been something changed. Exactly. You know, instead of I love you, I hate you, or whatever, you know. <laughs> Is this book for big businesses, or are small businesses facing the same issues? Well, I wrote it really for everyone. I tried to make it interesting with some good stories and examples. I tried to make the examples real world stuff that people identify with. But really, my, my thesis is really for the C-suite, the executive suite, to give them an understanding without it being a bunch of technical gobbledygook, which cyber mostly is, about what the issues are and how they need to frame it and think about it. Like uh, the last chapter in the book uh, is 27 very specific recommendations. My, my editor, uh, my uh, publisher, by the way, was very good at directing me that way. And the first one in there, the first big one, I think, is Put cyber in terms of business. Stop talking about it as a technology. Talk about it as just part of your business. In fact, there's one part earlier in the book I say, you know, if you think about cyber as your competition, you'll respond a lot better to it because people respond to competition, right? If I lose a sale because someone had a better product, think of it that way. How, what would you do? How would you investigate the fact that we lost a sale, right? Is it because I didn't paint it green versus it's painted blue or Whatever it is, think of cyber that way. It's just part of your business. It's part of business. In chapter one, you lay out plain and clear, a breach is going to happen. Yeah. Um, why are you so sure most companies, because they have securities are already in place, but why are you so sure that no plan is bulletproof? Because we're human beings. Uh, we make mistakes. Uh, we make mistakes, mistakes when we build the products. We make mistakes when we implement the products. Uh, and, but mostly we're fooled. We're fooled lots of ways. Social engineering is a classic example. That's, that, that's the essence of a phishing attack. But, but at the, it's, we're just human beings and we make mistakes. And these, you know, the other thing, it's a detail, but an important one, the internet's been built in the last 30 years. It's like we built the entire universe in 30 years. So it was built with the intention of let's get online, let's get business going, let's get commerce going, let's have communications going, whatever that is. We weren't thinking about security. We really haven't been thinking about security until about 2005 or so. It was always down in the corner of the IT department, those poor guys in the basement that sort of had to deal with it. And 
God help them if they sort of stopped or blocked the CEO's email because it had a problem. They'd lose their job. It was a career limiting event. But now these guys are very important because they help keep the business open and operating smoothly. How trusting are we to take our credit card and just hand it to someone? You know, because that's what we think. Oh, we can buy things, you know, easily, more convenient, but yet. Oh, <laughs> things happen. Um, look, uh, before the internet came along, credit cards are being stolen left, right, and center, right, with those carbon copies at restaurants and what have you. There's, you know, there's no such thing as perfect protection. If a bad guy, as my dad used to teach me, you know, a lock just keeps an honest man honest. So, uh, if it can be stolen and used in a bad way, it probably will be. Uh, just a funny story that might be interesting. We were, when the internet was happening, this was like 1993 or four, and I was looking at DoubleClick, which was one of the first uh, advertising companies on the internet. We actually did it. But um, there was, people were advertising transactions, right? They want, you want to buy something? This is actually before Amazon. And so who would have Transactions. Who who would who would you think would be the first industry to come up with pay to play or pay to see something? Pornography. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah. And yeah. and my partners were like really skeptical. I'm a young guy. My hair was black. Skeptical. And um, they said, Well, Ray, can you demonstrate this to me? And I said, Well, yes, I can. But I'm going to have to show you on a pornographic site. And they were like, What? What? You know? And I and I did. And they were just like blown away that I could put a credit card. I used my partner's credit card, not mine put a credit card in the machine and boom, something came up and it's like, wow. So uh, things happen. And let's talk about that. Okay. You believe that's the only choice at this point for companies? Certainly at this time. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, the, the threats are coming at us from everywhere and uh, not just uh, Russia or China or North Korea. They're coming at us from Kansas and Mexico and even New York. Uh, so the threats are coming at us. We don't know what those threats look like. We don't, the software that is the threat, we can't, enter, we can't analyze it fast enough. So in a situation where you can't uh, stop the threat instantly, you have to be prepared to receive the threat, and that's the notion of resilience. Resilience is a, an old human concept, right? I mean, we live, we're in a room here in a building on the second floor. There's uh, sprinklers above us. There's probably some uh, gas detection systems, heat detection systems, alarm systems, stairways to get us out of here if this place catches on fire. Also, someone gave this building a certificate of uh, com a compliance certificate for occupancy and use, right? So none of that exists in the network. None. Nothing. So, uh, but that concept should exist. We are prepared if this building catches on fire. You and I will get out of here very safely if something were to happen bad here. So it's a, uh, it, it's, it, resilience is actually very, but you know, where does the fire start? I don't care. It's a fire. Where does that data breach start? I don't care. I'm losing my data. I need to be able to take action. To take action means you have a fundamental understanding of your, your building or your company or your infrastructure. And that's where uh, the, the rule one, visibility and understanding. I hear the fire department uh, running right now. If they're running to a modern building, even this building, by the time they get there, they will know where the fire is. They'll have the blueprints of the building up on their computers. And when they walk in the door, they know exactly what they're going to do. Exactly where to attack the that's fire. That's right. Exactly yeah. where to. And that's, that's the phase of the Internet cybersecurity world we're in right now. People will get an understanding. It'll take technology. It'll take automation. And, and so the smart people will be able to look at all this stuff and they'll see the breach happening and they'll be able to take action. We have my product at Red Seal does that. We create, visit, we create a Google map, if you will, of your network. We show you every pathway, every path, even the ones you don't know exist. We show you every one of them. And so if something bad happens, we give you recommendations about how to deal with it. Us and we actually operate in a very complicated ecosystem because it's not just one product. It's a family of products that help you do that. So resilience is being prepared for when the unexpected happens. We live in a very complicated world and you need, need tools to survive it. Every day we hear about major breaches. It's almost um, commonplace now. Uh, talk a little bit about Target, the Target attack. Sure. Um, what did Target do right? Uh, what, did they, uh, what lessons can we learn from the company from what they did wrong? Target did a lot of things right. They had great products and great engineering. They actually set up their detection systems uh, they had their networks configured, they were operating them just as they thought they should be. Or maybe they weren't. 
but they did have the right people and products. The target attack was pretty simple. A third party supplier, one of your supply chain members, and every company has thousands of them, with credentials, came onto the target network to do some work on their heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. So unrelated to the digital business, unrelated to the target business, just keeping the lights on, so to speak. Uh, that computer was infected. The infection found its way onto their main network, the HVAC network. The HVAC, the HVAC network was connected to the main target corporate network. That was the mistake. And that was connected to the uh, retail networks. And maybe that was intentional, maybe it wasn't, don't know. But ultimately, that malware, which was hunting for credit card numbers, it, it was automated. It was just looking for a pattern in the data. Went out to the cash registers. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. The cash register people actually had done it right. When those cash registers are shut down, they wipe the disk, so they upload the data at night, and they, they wipe out all the data so it's, it can't be stolen. Well, that was brilliant, except for one thing. If you don't power down the cash register, all that data is kept in the memory of the machine, not on a hard drive. And that's where the malware found it, up in the memory of the machine. So even though they were doing all the right things and they had the procedures in place, it was in the memory. So exfiltration, 40 million records. Now, the other thing they did right, they had all the detection systems. And their firehouse, if you will, was lit up. The alarms are going off. They were getting phone books of information. Oh my gosh, what's happening? In fact, they were a little confused. They were overwhelmed with alarms. But the thing that Target really did wrong, all this was just technical. What they really did wrong, it was Christmas. This virus was infecting all their selling points, so that's the revenue machine. Management made a decision not to protect the customer. They left the cash registers on, they let the software steal the data so that they could let, collect the money from the people. They all got fired right from the top, boom, all the way through, because they made a bad choice. They didn't protect your data or my data, they protected themselves. And that so was if they shut down the cash registers, that, I mean, that's their biggest revenue. It is their revenue. Time season, so what should they have done? They should that? have shut down the cash registers, and then investigated the problem and wiped it out, and then turned them back on. They, they would have lost two or three days of revenue, maybe, I don't know, a week or two, two weeks. Two or three days around Christmas? I hear you. That would, so imagine you're the CEO of Target, and you're in the boardroom. You've got these technical guys over here talking gobbledygook. Boss, boss, you know, blah, 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 the virus, and, blah, blah. and he's like, I, you know, wait, so you mean I gotta shut down my cash registers and go out of business, or wow. what do you do? That was the choice. That's why Target was so, it, it, it involved technology, it involved policy. What's the policy? I'll bet you they have a policy that says that HVAC network does not talk to the corporate network, but they couldn't prove it, or they had, mal, had not uh, implemented it properly. But more importantly, it was about governance. And public relations. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, yeah. Not you quite mentioned like something the in your answer about when uh, the HVAC uh, mm -hmm. portion was connected to the other portion of the business. You said that was a mistake. What, do you think that in companies they should separate? Yes. No, I was going to say in the it's Internet false. of Things, it's you false. want everything connected, don't you? You or? do, but you want segmentation. Uh, this building is full of rooms and doors. You want the same thing on your network. Uh, if this was one giant room with all 100 people on this floor or whatever, we'd be noisy, we couldn't hear each other, we couldn't work. Likewise, in the network, you want to segment things in logical places. The Internet of Things is a classic example, or how about our power grid and all that sort of. You need segmentation is a very effective strategy, but you have to prove it. You have to implement it properly and then test it to make sure you've actually put the door. What, what if I had a, a hole in the wall there, but I put the door over there to, to nowhere? You can do that in software. This is just software, virtual stuff. So you got to make sure it's in the right place and again, close and close the door. And that's that's the visibility, understanding what that Google, I'm sorry, what that uh, yeah, what that Google network uh, looks like. Uh, that's what that's step one. We started a little bit talking about the cost of a cyber attack, um, um, lawsuits, uh, credibility, trust. Um, what did it? cost target? I think it's still costing them something. I've seen, you know, so they probably had some insurance to cover some out-of-pocket expenses of uh, hundreds of millions, I'm sure. It cost them stock price early on, but when they fired the management and brought in new ones, the stock recovered. So people had some confidence in the new people that were running the business. They had learned a tremendous lesson, right? It's like, your building's not going to burn down twice, we hope. 
but it's, you know, money is one thing, and most of these large companies, they're self-insured, right? I mean, look at Sony. They were self-insured. I don't know what it cost them to replace all their equipment, because that's what they had to do. But they did. Uh, it's really about trust and, and confidence. You know, when you get that phone call that your credit card's been ripped off and you think back, oh, you know, or, or uh, at least where I live, we have a town network and if someone's credit card gets ripped off at the local gas station, everyone, it lights up on our network so we all know not to use that. And that gas station takes a hit, right? People will stop using it. So word of mouth, trust, confidence is probably the biggest long-term impact. I think. You know, balance sheets are big and heavy. There's, Target has a lot of cash. That's interesting. You said in your town, if someone uses a credit card at the, the local gas station and... It gets ripped off. Uh -huh. They'll report it on the set. And they'll, you know, it, it's called PV Forum. And they'll uh, say, oh, God, I use my credit card at the... I'll save the name at the station. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I'm getting uh, Lyft and Uber charges in San Francisco and Dallas. And it's like, so that's where I last used. So the persons whose card is blaming the gas station guy. Well, it's not the gas station guy, it's the credit card reader. Someone put one of those sleeves, you know these things, you've seen them? And it probably installed it at midnight and 10 hours later he's getting credit cards left, right and center and it only takes that long and it could be used everywhere. But he got blamed. Why did we learn so long after an attack that an attack has taken place? I mean it could be years, months that we've learned. Yeah. It's getting better, but it's still way too long. It's as if uh, we had a fire in the building burned down and someone called the fire department 90 days from now. That's kind of the world we're in right now with cyber. We get a lot, there's a lot of technology that alarms, gives you alarms that something bad is happening. But if you don't have a good understanding of your infrastructure, your network, and how it's all put together, you may hunt around for the problem for a long time or may not know what to do about it. In the meantime, out the door it goes. We're going to get into the weeds a little bit. Um, what's the disaster recovery plan and uh, a business continuity plan? And, and the, also the cyber recovery plan. These are plans that you suggest that businesses have ready to go. Yeah. Uh, the disaster, so there's three different things there. The disaster recovery plan uh, is exactly, it's, it's, it's if there is a disaster. 9-11 showed us how vulnerable New York was to big disasters. And now the large financial institutions and banks, there's actually laws that require them to have multiple data centers that literally replicate all, so data center A is the main one, it's collecting, doing data, whatever, and B is over here ready, it's what's called hot standby, it's ready to go. So if this one, if a plane crashed into this one and brought it down, literally an automatic switch is flipped this comes online and it looks good. That's disaster recovery. And then you'll try to rebuild this one and so forth. Um, the business continuity plan, this is uh, not so much for total wipeout disasters, but what if the power goes out? Uh, what if uh, your internet uh, connectivity gets cut? Uh, someone in a backhoe in the parking lot cuts across your fiber optics line. So in that case, you would have multiple internet connections and this one goes out, this one's still up, people are still alive, the op building is operating, the business is operating, but you just had a continuity issue rather than a full onset disaster. And, then so, and so this is, there are people that thought about it in advance, what can go wrong? They thought about if that went wrong, what I would have to have in place, and having this second data center in the first case was they decided we just, if it cost us $100 million for this data center, we're gonna spend $200 million because that's what you have to do. Um, and uh, so you think it through, you think about what can go wrong and you design your business processes and your other things around it. In the cyber case, it's a little different. For, for you already indicated, because you may not know for a while that you have a problem. Uh, but when you do figure out you have a problem, it's virtual, remember it's software. It's not like you can send a bunch of uh, guys with hard hats and uh, tool belts into a data center and unplug something. It, that's not, it's not that easy. You have to have a lot of analytics and a lot of capability to understand exactly what's going on. And I guarantee if you've got one piece of malware that's causing you problems, you've got many others. So it's like the fire's been lit all over Target. That was the case. It was all over their network. Uh, Sony was the same thing. It was all their routers were infected. So it's a, it's a, you have to, again, you have, in the book I talk about this, you have to say, what can go wrong? 
what could go, and then how would I design around that? So uh, automobiles, let's go down that one for a minute if you, on this one, Re resilience, right? So what could go wrong? Well, I could hit a tree, right? And in 1960, if I hit a tree, I was dead. But if you hit a tree today, you're probably gonna walk away. You may be bruised, you may be a little sore, whatever, but the airbag's gonna keep you alive, the seatbelt's gonna keep you in place, and you're gonna walk away from hitting that tree. That's resilience. That's the way you need to think about these networks. You think, if this is my data center, and if the bad guys got in it, they're likely gonna be shipping data out this way. I need to have special protections here. The other thing that's, that's useful, just as in the car, in a car, what, what matters in a car? The human being. What matters in the data center? The data, and which data? Which do you really, what, what can't you lose? Where do you need to put all your focus on making sure that you don't lose that core piece of information? That's really important. And that's, any, if I were in a boardroom, I'd say, you just need to decide what's important to you guys. What's important, and then let's then I can put a plan together yeah, for you. Yeah, and pull back from there. Yeah, pull back from there. That's a cyber uh, recovery plan. Pop culture depicts hackers as geniuses. Uh, you say hacks are done in stages and can be detected before a lot of damage is done. Um, how so? Some of these guys just aren't geniuses. They're just they're at it, and you know, kind of yeah. voila. Cyber hack is really kind of an existential threat. You know, three guys in a crappy apartment somewhere can attack J.P. Morgan, and they can create all kinds of havoc. But it's not those three guys sitting there tapping. It's the 1,000 or 2,000 PCs they have in the room with them that's on automated attacking sequence. I once took a tour of the New York Stock Exchange, and they have a big board in there that shows all the attacks. They have a half a trillion attacks a day, half a trillion. And they have these vector, they have these cool arcs that come into the New York, you see where the attacks are coming from. And they use that inbound data to adjust their defenses and stuff, and, and, and there's a handful get through every day and they deal with them. But uh, A half trillion cyber attacks a day? Some packets trying to hit your firewall to find a hole in it. And yeah, it's, it's extraordinary, it, it's extraordinary. Um, so, so think of it this way, the bad guys, the hackers, just have to get lucky once. And you gotta be lucky 100% of the time. Well, we're humans, we're not. So that's why being prepared if they do get through matters. So the, the hacks, you know, like I say, it's three guys, but they've got 3,000 computers running all this automation. And the, this target attack, you can go on the internet and buy the tools that the target attack, you, that, that the bad guys on the target attack had infested this HVAC supply chain guy. This stuff is available. I could, for the computer, go on the dark web, pull you up and see what someone bought your name for last. How do you best design resilience into your computer system? The number one thing is to have a good backup. Because one of the key attacks these days that results from a phishing attack is ransomware. We know what ransomware is, right? Your computer gets taken over and you have to pay money to some dark person, bitcoins or whatever, to get your access back. And maybe you're lucky and you pay it and they give it back to you. Maybe they don't. But the number one thing for that is just to have a backup. And one time I was at a cocktail party in my town and some there was a woman there who had been attacked with ransomware. She paid it. They didn't release her computer, and of course she was just mortified. And I said, ma'am, didn't you, didn't you have a backup of your computer? She says, what's that? I said, oh, okay. So this is a, you know, on a, on, on a, a CD-ROM or some other backup system, a copy of what's on your computer. And today there are services that every individual can buy that automatically keep a complete copy of everything on your computer in a secure location in the cloud. You pay $5 a month or $9 a month or something like that. Uh, Apple has a built-in thing that I use. But if I had a ransomware attack, and we've had them at my little company, Red Seal, a ransomware attack, you just simply wipe the hard drive and bring the latest backup and put it on and you're back in business within hours. It's interesting. I remember when we started, really started getting into computers, everyone always had, did you back up? And for some reason, people stop saying that. Too bad, because uh, that's that's the number one thing you got to do. And then still, if, you still have to back up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, the other thing would be to change your password. If you if you're mobile, you know, if you're home and your computer never leaves the house, and the chance of the computer being there was a time when always computers were stolen. Nowadays, computers are commodities, and people rarely steal the computers unless they believe there's data on them. So you know, 
but password changing is important too. So we have to be active in this thing. We do. Uh, it's we a, we right. can't be passive in right. cybersecurity. Yeah, when you walk down the street in New York, are you active? Are you sort of, uh, we call it situational awareness. That's what they say in the military. Are you aware of where you're walking, when you're walking, what time, and things going on around you? It's likewise in the digital universe as well. Interesting. You say a network can be secure or efficient, but not both? Not both, yeah. This is a, an age-old um, conflict. Inside of a sophisticated, large, typically, organization, there are the security guys. And then there are the network guys. And the security guys are to keep the bad things out and kind of make your life hard when you log in, dual factor authentication, other sorts of techniques. This, this guy over here, the network guy, his job is to make sure the email flows to the CEO. And he'll lose his job if email stops flowing. This guy loses his job if they have a breach. So this guy's about efficiency. This guy's about security. And we haven't culturally reconciled those two things yet. Now, I think they can. I think we operate the network at my company quite efficiently and quite securely. But I don't think everybody kind of believes. These guys over here will tell you it'll never, you, can't, you cannot be efficient and secure. And this guy over here will tell you you can't be secure and efficient. And that's just, and so they're in the room arguing with the CIO uh, their cases, that's what they're going to tell you. And, um, but I think you can, but today it's a cultural thing. You say networks should never be allowed to operate while breaches are not yet contained. Right. And you explained that so well with Target because they had that choice. Unfortunately, the wrong one was made. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> building's on fire. Oh, everybody just stay seated, keep working. Really? Does that make sense? Um, you know, uh, look with the Tylenol. The Tylenol case is so famous for making the right choice. They pulled everything off they the shelf. They pulled everything off the They couldn't tell you which pharmacy had the bad aspirin or whatever, right? They couldn't tell us that. So what they said, we just shut it down. Pull it all back. That was brilliant. We studied that in business school. That was a, and, and now there are cyber cases that they ought to be teaching in business school very similarly, uh, it seems to me, right? That was a, they made an ethical choice. Now, contaminated Tylenol could kill people. I would argue that cyber can kill people. There's been a few people killed as a result of cyber attacks in this world. We've been very fortunate so far, but no doubt it's coming. We talk a little bit about the user, um, how big a role the user plays in terms of opening up the entire system to a, an attack. You know, simply clicking on an email. Mm -hmm. What responsibility should people play in making sure a system is secure? I think they're, they should. I think individuals are, should be held accountable and can be held accountable. So for example, uh, we already require this of people to close the door behind them. You know, when you go through a secure door, you sometimes there's signs that say, wait for that door to close before you move on. Simple things, and some people have view that as annoying uh, when they have to learn something new. But we are individually responsible. There are companies now that are starting to put in place policies whereby if you fail a phishing simulation, and we do, everybody does it. I don't know if you do it in your business. You should. If you fail too many times, we can reme take some remedial action, such as more training, or we can fire you, or whatever. Now, there are some people who, um, like the CEO, if that person failed the phishing test multiple times, are you going to go fire the CEO? No, but a remedial action might be strip all his email of every attachment and make him, make her or him re require to do something different to get that attachment. Make them verify before they just randomly click on something. And it is through an attachment. Typically. Yeah, you, know, you can't just read an email. You have to do something beyond yeah. opening the email. You have to take an action, right. That, ma yeah, right. Although I just read in the paper this week, someone has come up with a way now it, of just, it's, in, it's embedded in the email, and we'll see how far that goes. That's, that may be detectable. See, the, the attachment is usually encrypted, and it's very hard to rip it apart and take a look. And don't go by the subject of an email. Go by who the email is from. Yeah, every, every email browser that I know, it may say Ray Rothrock there, to Ray Rothrock, but when I pass my mouse over it, it'll highlight the actual technical mail address, which may be badguy at bulu.com, and it says Ray Rothrock. But my English, Ray Rothrock, okay, fine, click. But if I look at the, the from, 
and it says, you know, badguyblue.com, then I should not do that. I should just delete it. The other thing I always tell people, I said, look, you know, if something's suspicious, do you, do you, uh, do you continue? No. What do you do? You throw it away. If, if a piece of email looks goofy, delete it. If they want you, if it's legitimate and the person wants to do business with you, they'll call you again or they'll send you another email. They'll, Ray, I sent you an email. Why the heck aren't you? Oh, okay, that was you. Okay, I thought it looked kind of suspicious. We just talked about the magic of the hyper, hypertext link. Yeah, that can lead you to, to bad places. Yeah, the, the, um, in fact, this attack that I just read about this week was it's a very legitimate email, it's a legitimate link, but it gets hijacked and it takes you to a website and that website is active in pushing back to your computer malware. So you never know you've been hit. Well, the most successful attacks begin with us being duped, uh, social engineering. Yeah. And we're getting, you know, the, the 2016 election certainly shows that there's more duping than just uh, stealing money. There's duping and getting you to take an action that you may not, you know, you, you, you're making judgments all the time on what you read and see and think. And if you're getting information to push you one way or another, that's social engineering. I mean, we've been doing this in print media forever and television media forever. I don't know why it's so unusual in uh, social networking. Really eye-opening when you talk about uh, our trust in the cloud uh, to keep our, our data. Elaborate how sometimes we may put too much trust in the cloud um, because we think uh, the cloud is somewhere in, in a satellite. We really don't really know the connections. Um, that could be dangerous as well. Yeah, you know, cloud computing is fabulous because it's lowering the cost of everything. What's made it and, and clouds, like everything, have been built fast. They've been built recently, so hopefully the engineers that designed all that had a little bit of security training and they've designed it differently than maybe the network was 20 years ago. So I give them credit there. The thing is, it's when a great branded name like Google or Microsoft or Oracle, somebody like that, puts up that cloud. You, because you've trusted Microsoft for so long, you trust their Azure cloud. Now, these are pretty good products and they work very well, but they're not perfect. But uh, there's a trust, a brand trust. We depend on brands, right? Uh, it's like profiling, right? We profile technology. Some, somebody sends you a wacko branded thing, you're going to be skeptical about it. But if it's Microsoft branded, you're going to probably trust it. That's okay. But you need to be careful. Um, you know, you put all your data up in a cloud, have that backup, right? What if that cloud went away? Microsoft's not going to go away. But what if, what if that data center got blown up or, or burned down or the power went out? and you don't have data anymore. So you need to have a backup. I like the way you really explain to people how the internet works, how our computers work. People really don't think about it. Um, we talk, you talk in your book about the vulnerable undersea cables. That's really getting into the weeds, so to speak, but you think people really need to know that. Well, look, uh, I think, well, I do. Uh, I think you need to know at some level how a car works when you get in and drive it or how a plane flies when you get in and fly it. Otherwise, you're just going to completely blindly trust whatever it is. So our modern lives are full of examples of technologies that transformed us. And undersea cables was one that transformed us. Connecting Europe and the U.S. when we did was transformational. Transformational on the diplomatic, commercial, everything. And the Internet's transformational too. Uh, it's about sharing information very quickly. So I think it's, I don't know, I think it's kind of important to have a, a little bit of understanding about it. I'm not saying everybody needs to understand DNS or be able to cite their IP number or any of that sort of stuff. But you've got to kind of know how stuff is connected. There's lots of layers. You know, one of the very interesting things I discovered researching, one of the, my uh, publishers said, you know, this is books, got a lot of interesting ideas. You need to back them all up. So, okay. So I did a lot of research. We got some folks to help us with some of that. And we discovered that Abraham Lincoln actually ran the Civil War via the telegraph. Uh, the State Department had a private company that would run wire from the executive office building all the way out to the generals, wherever they were. They wasn't very far away, two or 300 miles maybe, 400 miles. But when, and whenever the army moved, they would run a new wire. Well, these wires are still out there somewhere. But in the movie Lincoln, the one that was just about 10 years ago or eight years ago, there's a scene where he goes into the basement of the executive office building and he kind of shares his worries and his, his, his executive pressure 
with these telegraph operators. And those are the guys that were tapping out messages. Only about a decade ago, we discovered when they were doing some renovation at the executive office building, all of the telegrams that Lincoln had written and received from his generals. It's an example of uh, the communication of the day and how it was used to basically fight a war and win a war gave him a great advantage. I bring that up because it's, it's, that's the internet. It's like there's a wire, there's a connection between here and there. There's a bunch of stuff in the middle, but the ability for you to talk to me instantly around the world anytime, that's, that's profound. And it kind of started with Lincoln. And also profound that it is literally a connection as opposed to something that's just in the air. Yeah. I think people think it's just out there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I, think you, I think you're right on that. They do things magic, you know. Yeah. It's not magic. It's technology. It's engineering. It's a lot of people keeping it going. What are some of the, the important things on your checklist that we should be doing right now um, that maybe a lot of businesses are not doing? First of all, I think uh, talking about cyber as business. I think is really fundamental. Um, uh, I've had the uh, great uh, luck of having seven IPOs when I was at Venrock, and I'm now on two public boards now. And, and the one thing I know about executives and boardrooms is they understand numbers. You've got to measure things. Out of all my years at Venrock investing in cyber companies, no one ever brought a deal to me that measured whether or not you'd done it right or that you were doing it right, or even gave me any kind of score. It just it wasn't necessary. But in a world where we don't want the threats look like, we have all this complicated technology, we don't understand how it all works, we don't even have a clear map of all the connections and where the data is. We need to score it. We need to understand it. So if you come in, if you're the CIO, you come to the board meeting, and uh, you say, I need $10 million, I'm going to invest it here, here, and here over the next year, I'm going to likely say, that's great, Vanessa, but uh, can you prove to me a year from now that you spent the money well and that you addressed the really important things? That's a, that's a new concept. And I introduced, my company introduced scoring two years ago. We called it the Digital Resilience Score. So how, how ready are you? How well do you know your network? It's a first approximation to having an inventory of what you have. Let's just start there. How many, how many computers do you have? How many routers do you have? How many connections do you have? Let's just start with that. But then you do all the other analytics that goes along with it. So measurement, that's another key thing. And, and people can come up with their own measures. You know, there are lots of ways to think about things. We've got one that's really simple. I think, with all due respect, board members like simple metrics. Is the profit more? Is the revenue more? Is the market share more? Is it less? It's a simple question. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? I think today in this cyber world, we need to measure more. You need to have an expert at the table. Someone probably needs to explain occasionally, like you say, getting into the weeds. Someone, you're going to go into the weeds. You are. If you've got an attack, you're in the weeds. The other thing, and this is, uh, uh, I'm not sure where Target fits in this category, but general counsel. You need to have, uh, I think the best general counsel are great lawyers, but they're also good advisors. You know, a, a lawyer's job is to keep you out of trouble, but a counselor's job is when you're in trouble, what are my options? And what does it cost me? And what are the risks? So you need to have someone there, not just the technical side, but also from that other side. You're a business person. You're running this business. Tell me what my choices are. If someone could have said to the CEO of Target, you know, we can, the technical guy says, if, we, if you give me a week or a day or whatever it is, I can cure this problem, then the legal guy or the risk guy can say, you know, that's a reasonable thing to do. Let them do it and we'll be back revenueing in two days or whatever. The, that's a conversation you cannot have with yourself. You cannot. So you need to have the right people in the room. And then sort of, sort of the fourth thing I would say, you need, look, you're, you're going to get hit because it's already in your network. As John Chambers, the former CEO of Cisco says there are two kinds of people in the world, right? Two kinds of companies in the world, those who've been attacked and those who don't yet know that they've been attacked. Um, y you, you need to have a plan. You need to you ask, what can go wrong? And who am I going to call, right? And what am I going to do? What, what happens at 3 in the morning when I get that phone call from my CIO who's just been pulled out of bed by his security knock somewhere in India or wherever it might be, I got a problem. 
It's that, that, that famous line from Apollo 13, Houston, I got a problem. You, we have a problem. That's a pretty big deal. And so you have to have a plan and you have to rehearse it. The best companies, and I've met many of them, they're, in, they're well down that path of having their own little fire departments to deal with it. So those are, you know, and then of course you need to have Red Seal uh, on your network so that you understand exactly what you have and what you can do with it if you had a problem. The good news is obviously you can bounce back. You can recover and survive an attack. Yes, I actually I think it becomes a competitive weapon. Uh, what if I'm prepared and what if I have an attack? It used to be the world was, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about my cyber because I don't want anybody to know I've got these issues. I had a cyber attack. You, Mr. Cusper, did you suffer? No. We're still in business and we're growing. I can use that as a competitive weapon, right? It's like that seal of trust or whatever, uh, underwriter's laboratory or something like that. It's, it, it's known. I think a role the government has, and we didn't really talk about that much, but we need some compliance. We, we need more. Uh, you know, you buy a car, it's been tested and certified. You buy a house, it's been tested and certified for occupancy. This building's been certified for occupancy. Is your network certified for occupancy? We're moving away from that, though, in, in our government, more or less, as opposed to more oversight. We're trying to move to less yeah, oversight. So yeah, it's risky. Maybe this is not the time for, for that. I, I don't think so, but, um, you know. Uh, maybe they're just leaving it up to individual businesses. Yeah. That's when I'm asked, actually, and I get asked this question a lot, particularly by state legislatures and such. I just say, you know, the feds are having a hard time figuring out what to do here. Maybe you as a state and you need to take the actions to protect your constituents. It turns out most of the data about us is in state governments. I mean, yeah, there's the IRS and all that, but think about it. your driver's license, all your arrest records or legal records or lawsuits, all your taxes, pay, all that stuff is local. Your voting registrations, all that, that's local, it's not federal. That's, we didn't even get into medical records. No, though. we didn't get into that, but yeah, that's all local too. So that's where, I mean, so I think, the, I think the states have a particularly important role to play here. You have invested in a, in a lot of business. What are the things that you're looking for? What's the framework of some of the businesses that you say this one will be a success? Well, not all of them were. <laughs> I had seven wipeouts out of the 53 that I did. But I would say the common characteristics, they have a leader, male or female. I've invested in, in female leaders as well who can articulate the problem very crisply. That old uh, cliche that uh, no one, everyone has time to write a seven page memo but not a one time to write a one page memo. Well, it's really a lot of truth in that and it's like presenting a company. If you can present the problem simply, you understand the problem. And if you understand the problem, then you could convey the solution. And as, as a leader of a company, there are three constituencies you have to convince. You have to convince investors to give you money, and simple, clear language is very important there. You have to convince employees to follow you, and they have choices. They have lots of choices, as do the investors. And then finally, you have to convince customers that your solution is quite good. The people who can articulate the problem, the solution, and the benefit in simple, clear terms the best. And then I would add a little sugar on that, a little icing on that cake, storytelling. Storytelling is essential. Uh, I have invested, I have made a decision to invest in a company in an afternoon. I had to go do a bunch of homework, but I said to myself, I'm doing this deal, I'll figure out how to justify it. Because the story was compelling, the entrepreneur was compelling, and this is like someone I would jump in the foxhole with. Uh, you know, this, this person will succeed one way or another. Um, it's when it gets mushy and complicated and all that that it kind of starts to drift and it doesn't work out so well. So that's, that's I think, the number one reason. You don't have to be uh, an engineer in that line of work. You don't, I mean, I, I'm just thinking about um, the, the most successful deals I've done. Uh, one was led by a lawyer who could write like you wouldn't believe and, and create a narrative. It's almost like that closing argument with the jury kind of thing. Uh, another was incredibly technical engineer, you know, PhD type, graduated from college when he was 17, but yet could just explain the most amazing things in such a succinct form. It, it literally within 30 seconds, you're like, oh, I get it, thank you, let's go on. They call it the elevator pitch, but you know. It's, le <laughs> it's legitimate. When I, when I was at 30 Rock, um, I worked on the 55th floor, which takes about a minute to get up. 
And so we used to joke that it's like you get on the elevator with the entrepreneur and says, oh, you're coming up to visit Venrock? Give me the pitch. One minute to the top. Ray, what made you successful? So what made me successful? Well, Venrock's a great brand. The Rockefeller family is a great brand. So I had access to a, I, literally, I remember when I joined the firm, the senior partner said, you work for the Rockefellers. You can do anything you want to do, so long as it's honorable. Uh, but remember, you have access to anybody in the world. You tell them you work for the Rockefeller family, you can get in there. And that's true. Uh, one of my most successful deals was Checkpoint Software in Israel. And I remember when I went there, it turns out there's a Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. And being from the Rockefeller family, um, it was kind of magical. They rolled out the red carpet and we did the deal. That's terrific. Yeah, it's wow. fun. But I think the other, you know, the other sort of success is hard work. Um, you know, what is it? Uh, preparation. When preparation meets opportunity, that's when th good things happen. That's your luck. As yeah, they that's say. yeah, luck. You know, <laughs> luck's a funny thing. Yeah. It sounds hard mystical. Yeah. It's hard work, being prepared, yeah. and yeah, you know, being at the right place at the right time. You know, I, I um, my wife uh, jokes with me. She says, "Ray, you say you never say no to anybody." I go, yeah. I said, that's right. If someone invites me to be on a panel in some odd place, I'll probably say yes. Why do I say yes? Because you never know where the next Steve Jobs is going to come from. You literally don't. You know, as being on the 55th floor at 30 Rock, that was not exactly an easy place to get to for entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley or from Chicago or Dallas. But they used to, one of the other lessons is like, if they want to come see you, take the meeting. What, what's the downside? An hour? 30 minutes? Wow, an hour. That's, that's generous there. <laughs> yeah, well, but I've, I've, I've seen them cut short. But, uh, uh, you know, you just never know. Yeah. Meet, greet, and of course then, you know, being polite and kind. Uh, at at Venrock, we had a, a um, in the old days before the internet, everyone would send in paper business plans and we would review them and we'd write a letter, a response. Mr. Rockefeller felt that if someone took the time to send you a plan, you had the responsibility to give them a written reply. That's a perfect thing. It's very polite, right? So I learned to write turn down letters uh, saying thank you very much, blah, blah, blah. And years later, I would meet someone who I never met before. They said, you know, I sent you a business plan in 1990 and you wrote the best letter. Thank you. I mean, people it's remember terrific. this stuff. Yeah, it's terrific. And I just think sometimes we are getting away from that. But oh, we're that totally just, away from that. That's just the way uh, the way I operated back in the I don't place. know whether people are overwhelmed, maybe getting too many pitches that they cannot hand write and read and respond, but I think that is something that definitely will stick with a person for the rest of their yeah. career. I think it does. If you, you know, people say, oh, he didn't even reply to that. You know, I don't even know. It's like also, you know, these are business plans. This is, this is proprietary information. We wanted to get it out of our office so that we couldn't be accused of maybe copying it or comparing and all that kind of stuff. That was just a sidebar. But, yeah, no, it's, uh, I think how you treat people matters. Excellent. Very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Great, great, great. conversation. And thank you for watching Sartor TV. I'm Vanessa Tyler. Join us next time where thought leaders come to share their ideas.